Oh, howdy, Internet. John Hess here from Filmmaker IQ with an ad meow mission that just might end my pathetic career here on YouTube. That's right, you read the title. I think I kind of love Tom Hooper's Cats. Look, I saw the trailer last summer and I was part of the society-wide gasp and recoil in horror. But I also know every one of those songs by heart. And when Rotten Tomatoes handed down an 18% and the New York Times taking sadistic pleasure in doing roundups of bad reviews, I knew I had to see it. Why? Because sometimes you just need to see something bad to reaffirm your sense of what is good. But also sometimes the darkest caves hold the greatest treasures. Now after three festive holiday $5 margaritas at Chili's, I stumbled alone into a theater to see this monstrosity and I found myself cheerfully singing along. Oh well, I never was there ever a cat so clever as magical Mr. Mistopheles. Meow, I don't typically do movie reviews, but I feel this movie is being unfairly thrown in a pillowcase and tossed in the alley. Someone needs to toe the line for the feed line. And unlike almost every reviewer I've read who may have only adopted the love of musicals from La La Land, I was born into it. I was molded by it. I first saw Cats in the seventh grade. Shortly after that, that big black double CD album became part of my regular musical rotation that included Phantom of the Opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, and eventually Evita. Yes, I was an Andrew Lloyd Webber nut. After high school, I even had Rum Tum Tugger business cards printed up that would leave in random public places as a prank. The product of an active imagination and a budding internet economy that allowed you to buy custom printed materials almost anonymously. Yeah. I am a strange nut, but I also know it. So this is not a video to encourage you to see cats. I just want to supply a different perspective and express something that I've been yearning for in the arts. I think no modern Hollywood musical captures the essence of the source material quite as successfully as the movie of Cats. Lord knows I really dislike Hooper's attempt at Les Miserables. But the reason I want to cover a bit of the history is there's a lot of elements being attributed to the movie that actually originated from the play. Now, as I describe Cats, know that it is an exercise in absurdist reductionism. It's like the blurb TCM writer Rick Polito used to describe The Wizard of Oz. Transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. So yeah, any description of cats is going to seem weird. And there's no do anything about it. Cats began, as many others have noted, from a collection of short poems T.S. Eliot wrote originally for his grandchildren called Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. The poems describe different cat personalities found in a group of jellical cats. Jellical cats are white and black. Jellical cats are of moderate size. Jellical cats jump like jumping jack. Jellical cats have moonlit eyes. They're quiet enough in the morning hours. They're quiet enough in the afternoon, reserving their terpsichorean powers to dance by the light of the jellical moon. Terpsichore is the name of one of the nine muses and goddess of dance and chorus, so you can see already the seeds of where this is going. Flash forward to 1977. Musical composer Andrew Lloyd Webber was practicing writing songs by adapting T.S. Eliot's cat poems, a childhood favorite of his, into music. In 1980, Webber performed his arrangements as a song cycle at his Sinmontin Festival, which he holds on his estate to workshop potential new projects. In attendance was Valerie Elliott, T.S. Eliot's executor, who brought Weber some unpublished cat poems, one of them being Grizabella the Glamour Cat, which was cut from the book because it was deemed too sad for children. But Grizabella and others sparked something in Weber. He saw a potential for a bigger show, bringing on producer Cameron McIntosh and Brian Brawley. McIntosh, in turn, brings in director Trevor Nunn from the Royal Shakespeare Company to give the production some Postache and gained the blessing of Valerie Elliott. And none recognized that the show couldn't really just be a collection of isolated songs. It had to have a narrative through line. Quote, 
we decided that if Elliot had thought of being serious, touching, almost tragic in his presentation of a feline character, then we had to be doing a show which could contain that material and the implications of it. Furthermore, we would have to achieve the sense of progression through themes more than incidences. Part of Noon's stipulation in joining the production was casting another member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, Judy Dench, in the dual role of Jenny Anydots and Grizabella. So they had a strong cast in line. Now they needed to get the money. And this was understandably hard to do with a show about cats with a plot you can only describe as a progression of themes. Weber underwrote the down payment for the theater himself by taking out a second mortgage on his house and the rest of the money was raised through 220 small investors who found the project through newspaper advertisements. The musical was scheduled to open on April 30th, 1981. But when rehearsal started in March, Nunn revealed that he had not yet completed the book which is the theater speak for the script. Even the score was incomplete. The central emotional song of the show, Memory, based on a melody that Weber had written for an abandoned Puccini project, still had no words. Weber's old collaborator Tim Rice took a crack at it, but the words were deemed too depressing. Director Nguyen adapted T.S. Eliot's poem, Rhapsody on a Windy Night, and was still changing lyrics all the way up to opening night. And then, one week before previews were set to begin, Judy Dench snapped her Achilles tendon during rehearsals. She left the show. The opening night was pushed back, but the previews went on as scheduled. Then on May 11, 1981, Cats opened at the New London Theater. Initial reviews were spectacular, and the show went on and on and on, finally closing after a record-breaking 8,924 performances, 21 years until it finally closed on its anniversary in 2002. The Broadway Transport opened on October 7th, 1982 to more mixed reviews, but it too went on to run in a record-breaking 7,485 performances closing on September 10th, 2000. One actress, Marlene Danielle, even performed in the Broadway production for its entire 18-year run. And those small investors that helped fund the initial show? Well, they made off with an estimated 3,500% return. By 2012, the royalties to the T.S. Eliot's estate were estimated to have totaled $100 million. Some of that used to establish a literary charity, Old Possum's Practical Trust, and set up the T.S. Eliot Prize, which has since become the, quote, most coveted award in poetry. Well, it wasn't too long until Hollywood came a calling. The first attempt to film Cats came in 1990s from Amblimation, the animation wing of Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. The company shut down without much coming from the project except for a few concept art drawings. Now, cool as they are, I think diehard Cats fans might have felt disappointed because a key part of the musical play is the physical dance numbers, and they just wouldn't translate to animation. In 1998, a direct-to-video film was shot at the Delphi Theater. This basically filmed the stage version, recording over a course of 18 days, which included two run-throughs captured from 16 camera angles and a couple of weeks of close-up pickup shots. Then in 2013, Andrea Lloyd Webber teased that Universal Pictures had purchased the rights to Cats years before and was putting the project into active development. In 2016, Tom Hooper is set to direct, and in the summer of 2019, we get the first look at the trailer at Comic-Con, and that's when the contents of the litter box hit the fan. So let's get the elephant out of the room first, the visual effects. All the actors in Cats were filmed on real sets in motion capture suits. Their bodies were then replaced with a digital furry double and CG was added to extend the set. So in many ways, it still ended up being an animated film after all. Now, I ended up seeing the film twice. I saw it again on Monday after my first screening just to make sure I wasn't completely under the influence of the $5 holiday margaritas. There are news stories that Hooper had even made some small VFX changes that were released after the movie opened. I can't tell whether I saw the old version or the new. Ultimately, I can also say that the VFX in this movie simply didn't bother me after a while. It's certainly not the level of something like Polar Express, which can only occasionally step out of the uncanny valley before plunging you back in with its weird soulless eyes. Now, re-watching the first trailer, it does seem like there's some polish in the version or versions that I saw, 
but it's hard to put my paw on it without a clear side-by-side -side comparison. But what struck me most is the people on screen, they don't really look like cats. They look like humans wearing furry skin-tight leotards. The exception being uh, maybe Judy Dench as Old Deuteronomy with a big cowardly lion mane. She kind of best makes that human to cat hybrid leap. But everyone else just looks like some sort of furry alien creature, which poses the question, did we really need to go through all that extra digital technology to make what looks like humans in costume? I mean, this getup cost me $3. Here I recorded the VFX artist section of the credits. This dense list of names takes about 60 seconds to scroll through, and I can't help but wonder if it would have been cheaper and more effective to just put the actors in costume and makeup and use CGI more for fine tuning and animating things like tails or ear movements. Sure, it might have had a different look. Sure, it might have resulted in other complications, but it feels to me, at least they wouldn't have taken the long digital way around to accomplish the same look. And perhaps they could have skirt charges of the uncanny valley. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that there was no really, really bad icky shots in the film. The mice and the Busby Berkeley dancing cockroaches were a, a bridge too far. But for the most part, I just accepted the visual aesthetic. Again, I appreciate the CGI criticism, but what I loved about Cats, the movie has to do with the performance and the audacity of the production. In order to raise the money to mount a movie musical, you need to first pre-sell it. And that's generally done these days on star power. Who do you have set to star in the picture? The problem is movie stars that are good for box office aren't trained and don't have the dancing and singing chops that veteran Broadway stars do. Sure, you might occasionally have a dance crossover like Christopher Walken or a vocal powerhouse crossover like Adele Dazim. Wolverine can carry a tune, but he's no match for the pipes of rock music legend Combe Wilkinson. And Johnny Depp as Sweeney, well, it kind of works through Burton's weird lens, but it's not the powerful, intimidating baritone that the show originally envisioned. The rigors of performing six to seven shows a week at the top of your game is a different beast than performing in front of a camera. But with Cats, well... Tom Hooper chose some cats that can actually sing and dance. Cast in the lead narrator role of Munkle Strap is Robbie Fairchild, whose pedigree includes the New York City Ballet, as well as award-winning debut in Broadway musical An American in Paris. As the innocent ingenue cat Victoria is Francesca Hayward from the Royal Ballet, which also supplied Steve McRae as Skimbleshanks the Railroad Cat. These folks aren't household names, but they hold down important roles and they can sing and dance very well. Next, Hooper reaches to the musical industry for star power with Jason Derulo, Jennifer Hudson, and even Taylor Swift. There's bona fide musical experience on display. For songs that require more humor, there's Rebel Wilson and James Corden. Wilson, your mileage will vary with how much you like her. Corden's Buster for Jones is actually, I actually liked more than I originally thought I would. With Idris Elba as McCavity, I'm sure the character in the show doesn't actually sing. He is sung about by Bombalarina and Demeter, which the show reduces to just Bombalarina as played by Taylor Swift. Now rounding up the cast are perhaps my favorite two, Judy Dench, who gender swaps old Deuteronomy gets in second chance at the show. She really commands the screen. And then Ian McKellen, who is unquestionably giving his all as Gus the Theater Cat. He brings so much that's fresh to the number, which is traditionally sung by Gus's caretaker, Jelly Lorem, that it is my favorite part of the film. If the plot of Cats is not the sequence of incidences, as the original director Trevor Noon describes, but a sequence of themes, I think Hooper's casting reflects that quite well. He manages to fill the roles with the right talent, still getting the names, but matching them better to their abilities. But what I really think is hanging up the critics about this movie is sort of our modern obsession with realism. Not, it's not only unfilmable, it's unstageable. It's a, a ridiculous enterprise, but one of the most successful musicals in the history of world theater. I think the big problem people can't get over is the plot of Cats. A quick overview. 
Victoria is a white cat thrown in an alley where she comes across a group of Jellicle cats. They are assembling for the Jellicle Ball, where each cat will sing about their life, hoping to be picked by the cat matriarch Old Deuteronomy to ascend in a chandelier and hot air balloon to the heavy side layer, where the cat will be reborn and come back again in a new Jellicle life. McCavity, the mystery cat, doesn't play fair and ends up catnapping all the contestants, but Old Deuteronomy sees through it and eventually selects poor, sad Grizzly. Bella, the worn down glamour cat. They all rejoice as she is sent to the heavy side layer and old Deuteronomy explains to the audience the proper etiquette when addressing a cat. Yeah, it's weird, but I want to describe the plot of another theatrical favorite which mirrors the plot structure of cats. Claire and Prince return to the Land of Sweets, which is under the rule of Sugar Plum Fairy when the prince was away. The prince recounts how Clara saved his life from the evil Mouse King, and a huge celebration is held where Spanish chocolates, Arabian coffee, Chinese tea, Russian candy canes, and a string of flowers all dance for the prince and Clara's amusement. The Sugar Plum Fairy and the prince dance to a song that is best described as a descending major scale before the prince and Clara ride off in a reindeer-powered sled. That, of course, was the plot of Act 2 of The Nutcracker. It was also criticized as being weird when it first came out, but it's since grown and become a traditional staple of most ballet companies. But no one goes to see The Nutcracker for the plot. People go see The Nutcracker for the dance and the music, the progression of themes, not incidences, that uh, Noon described. And this progression of themes is the key that unlocks all of this. Fixating on the plot of Cats is about as useless as fixating on the plot of the Beatles album Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band. There is no plot, except whatever thin ribbons are there to connect the songs. It's about the themes, or in the case of Cats, the music, the poetry, and the dance. And that's what I love about whimsical surrealist fantasy. You can know that intellectually this is all nonsense, but emotionally you can buy into it. When you can free a story from the total constraints of reality, free of incidents that must lead from one to the next, free of cause and effect, anything becomes possible. Creativity runs rampant. It's almost a hedonistic form of storytelling, going only where the storyteller fancies, focusing only on what is fun and interesting. The closest thing we have to real dreams that meander and also don't make much sense. The key point is you have to emotionally engage, and here it takes two to play that game. But this is why these kinds of nonsensical plots or segments are so fitting for musicals. The music of the musical goes straight for the feelings, and the visuals and the meta-narrative can sort of build on top of it, rather than vice versa that we're coming to expect from mainstream cinema. The whimsical surrealist fantasy is not something we're unfamiliar with, from old staples like the aforementioned Wizard of Oz to some of my favorite more modern pieces, like the 1983 film adaptation of Joseph Papp's restaging of The Pirates of Penzance, which leans hard on its paradoxical storyline. Now here, they're singing loudly about how quiet they are. No sound at all, we never speak a word, a vice foot, or we be distinctly heard. That just brings me so much joy. Andrew Lloyd Webber is no stranger to this style. His first Jesus Christ Superstar takes the familiar passion play and then asks, why couldn't Jesus have come today and been a rock star instead? If you'd come today, you could have reached the whole nation. Israel in for BC had no mass communication. Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat takes it even further. The direct-to-tape version with some truly stunning visuals and envisioning Pharaoh as a Nashville king. Well, this dream has got me all shook up. Treat me nice, tell me what it means. Who could forget the whimsical surrealist fantasy of Tommy, 1975, featuring a deaf, dumb, and blind kid that sure plays a mean pinball. But there's another record breaker of 1975 that I consider the best movie musical ever made. The Rocky Horror Picture Show, featuring iconic transsexual transvestite from Transylvania that I'm sure gave the squares the heebie-jeebies as Cats does today. Transylvania. Let me... Don't dream it, baby. Be it. At least until you get shot down by some laser beams.
God! You killed them. But I thought you liked them. They liked you. They didn't like me! Now, maybe you will look at these examples and say that, John, you're crazy. But I love this stuff. Perhaps it's just a form of nostalgia. Remembering a younger and more innocent time when I still believed in magic and anything, anything at all could happen. But now as a grown adult who knows better, I find myself wanting more and more to believe in magic. Not because I want magical powers, but because I want to be that person that believes in magic. I want the world to look new and exciting as it once did. Cats is not a train wreck that you can't stop watching. It's a purposely designed train ride of emotional themes. Silly, funny, stupid, yeah, a little sexy, and sad. It's a highly stylized dance review that's supposed to bypass the part of your brain that interprets story and goes straight to your motion processor. It works better and better with familiarity, and of course, it won't work on all. And I guess despite some off-putting visuals, that's why I uh, kind of loved the Cats movie. Well, it's that time of show where we paw through the closing sales pitch. Like and subscribe. Well, I doubt there's many takers up on that. Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Thanks to our first Hall of Famer patron, Glenn Lindmark, and our A-team sponsors, you guys rock. As always, you can help fund my catch-related psychological therapy sessions by picking up your very own official Filmmaker IQ merch in the shelf below. Just when my analyst thought we were making a breakthrough with my session with frame rate, this movie comes along. Oh well, all that's left for me to say is to go out there and make something great now. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at Filmmaker IQ.